a little bit about Bob Fletcher. Uh, but please, again, make sure you get over to the website. Check it out. We put uh, news stories, which will appear on the homepage, uh, down near the bottom every single day. Sometimes we miss out on the weekends because, you know, even we need days off. But uh, uh, So anyways, who is Bob Fletcher? Well, he's a businessman. He's an investigator, a film producer, a radio personality, author, federal witness, whistleblower, patriot. He's he's all that. And a bag of books, folks, because uh, he's going to, the, the information that he's going to share with us tonight, um, well, you can write a lot of books. There's that much. I don't even know if we'll get to everything tonight. But one thing we are going to get to is... Well, this planet, call it Planet X, call it Nibiru, call it what you will, but uh, there are some pretty prominent people out there who claim it is there and that it is coming our way. So we'll see uh, where we go tonight here. We'll take your calls as well. Um, Bob Fletcher, I'm going to bring him on the air with us here in just a second. Um, Doing all this on my own, folks, so i got to kind of talk you through it as I go. Otherwise, it's going to be dead air. All right, so here we go. Bob Fletcher. He's been here before, by the way. All right, I'm just waiting on an answer, and we'll uh, we'll get this. Okay, I see what happened. All right, I got right. you now, Bob. That, that's Yeah, I was a little confused. I couldn't hear you, but now I can. No, all right. Well, welcome aboard. I, I appreciate you coming back on Late Night in the Midlands, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you tonight. Ah. Uh-huh. Thank you very much, and um, we've got a lot of new things I want to talk about, but basically it's all the same, uh, our same consideration, our, our serious problem out there. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, wherever you would like to start would be just great. Um, I'll tell you, I would like to say this. i seen this uh, on your website, the crop circle picture, which I've seen that crop circle before, but what I haven't seen before is how you laid it out. There's another picture below, and it pretty much shows the constellation and, and what you're looking at in that crop circle, and yes. I, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? And I, I, yeah, yeah, I do. Of course, that's one of 800 million bits of pieces, but, <laughs> but, but yes, I do, yes. Yeah, the bottom line is and and actually there are several others that that I don't I don't feel schooled enough to really get into that too much but nonetheless there are several that are all kind of did in indications of uh, of the Nibiru coming back in okay well you know, yeah well I'll I'll just say this that that crop circle I mean you know people always say well you know where's the warnings like that kind of looks like one to me so but like you said it's one of the many so wherever you'd like to start with this topic is okay with me uh, uh Go for it. Oh, okay, and uh, and unfortunately, <clears throat> because I've uh, I've been I've been doing this not necessarily with this particular subject, but my investigative stuff. I've been doing it for so long that I found out that it's best uh, um, for me to give a little bit of background. I hate to do that because it takes time, but I won't take too much time. But people have to so that they understand. Uh, you know, you, in my case, I've been trying to you know chasing bad guys basically in government for so long. You know, but there are people that don't know uh, anything about it, and then there are people that know a little bit, and then there are people that know a lot, and then, there, you know, that kind of thing. So we kind of try to uh, bring everybody up to speed in the first few minutes, uh, you know, on the entire situation. <laughs> bring, <laughs> bring them up to speed on 100 years of corruption, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> All right, let's do that then. All right, so 100 years of corruption coming up. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, we are That's live, fine. and and I'll try to. You give me a heads up on your when you're going to do your breaks, and I, I'm completely cool with this. You know, it's about my my four thousandth uh, radio interview, so I'm almost understanding it now. All right, great. Well, well, we're live now, so we can uh, we can okay. go we can go right ahead. Uh, we don't have another a break coming up for almost an hour now. So okay, very good. But it's a, it's really a pleasure to be back again, uh, and because um, we. Uh, we, we've spoken, and what, what has uh, really occupied my time now for, um, well, it's been about over three years, but it even went back farther than that. But so, as I was saying, so that everybody kind of understand, uh, this is even something that I would not have even put my name to this without having an awful lot, uh, without being totally convinced that, in fact, this is a real situation. Uh, I'm, I'm not a... Um, uh, and I don't mean to demean anybody that's a, a, a reporter or anything of that sort, but I'm not, I'm not like a newspaper reporter or a guy that's been doing uh, you know, journalism for a long time or anything of that sort. Uh, I ended up becoming, actually 30 years ago, I was um, uh, accidentally, if you will, dragged into the corruption of government 
and I was overwhelmed when it happened, like so many other people, when they really find out how generally corrupted the government is, right straight across the board. And um, uh, it, it's a, a very interesting story. As I mentioned, going, going way back, I can't, we can't spend the time logically on giving uh, those people that like, don't know me at all, but I'm going to try to give you a very brief situation. Uh, what happened was I had a business. I was in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had a business in the 80s, uh, and I uh, was expanding that company. It literally was very simply a toy manufacturing company. Uh, so uh, it, it was totally not related to politics, not related to journalism or, or exposing government to corruption or any of those things. I was just trying to make my first million dollars, the American dream, as they say. Yeah. And what happened was I merged my company with a, a company and a particular fellow that headed it up. His name was Gary Best, uh, and uh, uh, he, had a, uh, um, he was owner of, uh, the president owner of uh, a holding company, I guess is the best way to call it. And he had several companies uh, under his belt that he owned under these variety of corporate names. But the bottom line was, uh, our deal, my deal with him was to uh, merge uh, with part of his, one of his companies that delivered products to the 7-Eleven convenience store types of uh, locations, a variety of things. And several of my toys he wanted to put into the, the, those stores, and it was a real good deal for me on the outside. Unfortunately, I never got paid, so it, it turned out obviously not to be a good deal. But what happened was, this gentleman, uh, using that term very loosely, this criminal son of a gun, was in fact uh, an arms supplier, an arms dealer supplying weapons to all of the small wars generated by the United States covert operations. He was in, uh, representing the uh, CIA, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Operations, uh, the Air Force intelligence, and a whole variety of the secret covert operators that actually ran all the wars around the globe. And uh, lo and behold, they wanted to uh, recruit myself. They wanted to utilize my toy company as a covert front, giving m the reason for his people to travel into a variety of different countries, do different things. And actually, in my case, he wanted me to be a, a covert messenger delivering uh, information and bringing information back from a variety of locations around the globe. At that time, they were doing the Iran-Contra stuff. That's uh, the uh, Nicaraguan rebels and the revolutionary group there. And the, the operations were also later to be discovered not only unconstitutional and wrong, uh, and they had, of course, the big investigations, for those of you old enough to remember it, the big investigations uh, called the Iran-Contra inquiries at the, the congressional level. I became a federal witness in those investigations. Then following that, because all of the people that were involved with this guy and doing all of the, what they call supplying weapons, the, the, the suppliers of the weapons, um, they were military generals that had all run the, the Vietnam War so many years earlier. Uh, and, of course, they had carried on their arms delivery operations for covert operations uh, in the, in, up to the future, and they were still doing it, and they were doing the same thing. Many of these operations became, uh, to my, my shock, uh, they were directly involved with narcotics, where they would actually deliver weapons, exchange half of the payment would be in narcotics, and actually fly the narcotics back to the United States, delivering it into the streets with mafia cooperation, as a matter of fact, but fly it literally back to our Air Force bases, our own air bases, unload the drugs off of the aircraft that were U.S. government-supplied airplanes that had delivered the drugs, I mean, delivered the weapons down to some place, wherever it was, and brought the drugs back. So it was, to my amazement, what we literally had, quite obviously, and then I was to find out that it had been going on for years and years, 20, 30, 40, I don't know how many more years ahead of me, but it had been going on for years with our intelligence community doing the jobs that we hope they're doing, covert good operations, but they were um, a handful or half of it at least, if not more, 
were criminal activities involving the exchange of narcotics, and this was going right out with the nod and the approval of the President of the United States. So uh, that's how, I, uh, and I was blown away. I witnessed it, I saw it, they were selling multi-million dollar aircraft out of my toy factory, they were moving missiles, Hellfire missiles, through my, my toy factory, uh, making the sales and all of that uh, uh, for, for operations all over the globe. And uh, so that's what got me into it. And I preface all of that so that you get a general handle, an idea, uh, and an understanding that, uh, again, I'm not just some writer that um, met a few people and interviews a few people. <laughs> the font. Go ahead, excuse me. Oh, no, I, I just. I, oh, no, I was just laughing there for a moment. Because, oh, okay. <laughs> if you have a question, as a matter of fact, feel free, because, but otherwise, it's best if I kind of just roll along with this and, and fill, uh, fill in the holes. Usually, uh, b before your, your uh, uh, the question might come to mind, I'll probably answer it. Oh, you bet. The, the, so the problem was, well, I, I, I don't know, I guess it's, it was really a problem. Uh, I ended up being brought back not just after the Iran-Contra mess with all of these characters. I ended up having people from the Pentagon, from the CIA, the FBI, the ATF, and every other variety of, uh, uh, let's say, law, hopefully, law enforcement agents contacted me and congressmen and senators and the intelligence committees and what have you at the extreme highest level uh, coming right out of the Capitol building and uh, all the congressional buildings. What would happen over the next few years that turned into 30 years? Um, but what happened is uh, people would call me, a, a senator would write me a letter or, or I would be called or contacted one way or another, what have you. And a lot of this was, by the way, before we even had uh, the Internet. So uh, they were... Uh, uh, you know, being sent to me by fax machines and things of that sort. But the questions were, coming from those folks, was uh, over and over again, somebody would say, Bob, what do you know about this name? What do you know about this operation? Have you ever heard the name of this operation? Or do you have any idea, have anybody, uh, this, this guy and that guy and that guy that was involved with uh, your, your toy company, um, had you ever heard that connected to this other name over here? So... I ended up supplying uh, investigative research information uh, that much of it became top secret or classified secret uh, after I delivered it to them. In other words, uh, you know, it was a, that's something I had given them that was so hot, so important at such a high level that they would classify it after I delivered it to them. And, and basically, I was originally a, a toy, a toy manu manufacturer. Now, uh, and not to shortchange myself, I had, and part of the reason of how I had been targeted to be merged with this uh, operation. By the way, it was called uh, VISTA, V-I-S-T-A was the name of the corporate entity uh, that had all of these operations going on. Um, and, uh, and later on, I found out they were involved with so many things, including the uh, blowing up of the Oklahoma building uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma back there, the federal building back in 95 uh, uh, or whenever it was. The... Um, uh, but they had their hands in many dirty deals way, way beyond um, uh, what I ever would have expected. So, I, anyhow, I became uh, a, a guy that was an investigative researcher with people, became friends of mine, congressmen, senators, central intelligence operatives, uh, one friend that became real close, uh, and uh, she, she was an, a, a woman a little bit older than myself that had been in the CIA and, and connected all the way back to Ronald Reagan's time. And uh, she literally wrote speeches and did analysis from the Central Intelligence Direction for um, uh, the, the Reagan administration uh, and, and, and many other people at that level. So when I, um, uh, as I moved forward, uh, as I say, I got dragged into just a huge multitude of, uh, uh, of uh, extraordinary investigations and inquiries. So a few years ago, and I won't go over all of them, but it even involved being actually contracted by Manuel Noriega's lawyers and uh, doing a request. I was in interviewed by the Intelligence Senate Intelligence Committee. I was uh, formally requested to put together a, a report on the Oklahoma bombs by the Senate Intelligence Committee, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's where it all started from. Uh, and so a few years ago, I was used to chasing money chasing the uh, senators and congressmen, et cetera, that uh, had 
in one way or another, we're, we're stealing, I'll put it in blunt terms, and, you know, and uh, diverting or fraudulently getting a couple million bucks for, for a new house they wanted to build in uh, Tahiti for themselves, or a new place, uh, uh, something they wanted to do over here, or a business they wanted to get into. But we're talking about the theft of millions of dollars, usually. And um, a million is a lot for an average guy like myself, and like most all of our, uh, our listeners. Um, but, th but it became commonplace so that if somebody called me and said, hey, have you ever heard of the so-and-so operation? It looks like they're involved with stealing about $10 million every, uh, every couple of months or something. Uh, and uh, those things became commonplace. But three, four years ago, I guess at this time, it's almost four, uh, I started looking into the disappearance of, uh, of several billion dollars. And uh, I, I couldn't figure out where it was going originally, uh, but then it even moved up from several billion dollars to several trillion dollars over a long period of time, all coming, going in the same direction. Uh, but the big problem is, uh, as we, you, you can commonly realize, when you start talking about a few billion or it moves into trillions, and it, you have a problem to figure out where could money like that go because you know you, you have to realize that like even in these giant drug and arms operations now we talk about arms you know arms contracts that go out for the the creation and study of new weapons and the manufacturing of weapons and aircraft and rockets and, and explosives and all of those uh, high level uh, type of um, weaponry uh, that's it, it's easy they can take a few million out of one little location and transfer it over here, or a couple million here and a couple million there, and pretty soon they've got a, a pretty good little bunch of money mm -hmm. to use in any manner they want. But if you get beyond billions and start talking trillions, and uh, then you really have you really have something strange going on, even for the commonplace thieves out of Washington D.C. And, and by the way, there's nothing partisan on this at all. My discovery was that the Senate, the Congress, and those uh, and assigned um, uh, people that are, uh, let's say, at the ambassadorial level, the assigned people, the people that are not even elected and are appointed into these high positions uh, of the administrations with each uh, presidency, uh, those people, uh, they, uh, there's there's no keeping track of it. Uh, it's so profuse. So. Uh, as I looked into it, for one thing, I discovered that the gold was all gone out of Fort Knox. Absolutely gone. And a lot of people don't realize that foreign nations have huge amounts of gold. I'm talking tons of gold on storage or, or deposit in the Fort Knox establishment, which is, in fact, of course, overseen by the Federal Reserve System. The Federal Reserve System, to most people's surprise, is nothing to do with the United States government. It is a private group of banks many years ago that bamboozled themselves into a position of being the overseers of all the production of money for the United States. They are the overseers of the gold in Fort Knox and the interest rates for the world coming out of the United States. And they are a separate entity with no connection officially to the government other than controlling the money in the entire globe. So we had a, um, uh, a couple back in 2008 and 10 when the money went bad all around the globe and they were having problems. A couple of countries, and uh, one of the primary ones was uh, Germany, came forward and they came back to the United States and they said, we have... 1,500 tons of gold on deposit at Fort Knox. There has been no audit of that money, that gold, in years and years. And the last one was almost a joke. I think it was back in 74, and it was actually a, a joke. It was not, not a viable audit at all. They showed them uh, like a broom closet filled with gold, and they said, oh, okay, it's all here. Uh, and that was the end of it. So they came over. The Germans needed the money. Their, their banks were, go, were on the rocks. And they said, we need to take um, a, a few thousand, um, uh, well, a block. So they needed to take out um, at least half of their 1,500 tons. And they were told 
that they could not, and they would not get an audit. They would come back in seven years. This was 2013. They said, you come back in about seven years, in 2020, and we'll see what we can work out for you. That was their first response. So that was by our own uh, Federal Reserve. And they told them that we're, um, uh, you know, that, that we're, we're not obligated to give you or permit you to do an audit. So what also happened around the same period of time, uh, the um, uh, Ron Paul, Senator Ron Paul, came forward, and he said the same thing. He said the United States people, the people that the taxation and the money and the gold in there belongs to the American public, we have to have an audit for the Senate and the Congress. They told them the same thing. They said, you have no permission to request an audit from us, so go away. So the bottom line was, and matter of fact, there ended up being several other amazing incidents I won't get into, but the International Monetary Fund of the European banks did the same request and were told to take a hike and go back to Europe. Go away. And also then, just before, going back backwards a little bit on this, uh, just before the 9-11 synthetic terrorist event that took down the Twin Towers, the day before that, uh, the, the fellow who was in charge of the Defense Department at that time, Donald Rumsfeld, came forward on a uh, congressional inquiry like one of the many that I was involved with. And he was asked, uh, about, well, a variety of questions, but he came forward and said, we have at the Defense Department, now listen to this figure now, he said, we have lost $2.3 trillion over the last few years that we cannot identify in our budget. The Defense Department literally had lost, two, according to them, $2.3 trillion. All right, so let me get back to my situation where I was trying to track some of this money and, uh, you know, which is overwhelming kind of a thing. And, and by the way, another point that I want to make is that in terms of uh, having hands tied and what have you, people don't generally realize that senators and congressmen do not, most of them, with the exception of, of a few, most of them are not qualified, are not cleared to have secret or above secret or top secret clearances. So that when they sign off, the Congress and the Senate signs off on what they call covert or black operations. And it's a, it may be like uh, one single contract for a billion dollars. Or it could be five contracts in one afternoon for $22 million each going out to a variety of directions. They have no idea, in reality, where the money's going, how it's being used, et cetera, et cetera. All right, they're giving a general vague thing like uh, something that will say uh, so-and-so operations, advanced study on uh, solar system tracking, radar, and sonar. And it'll, be, it'll say $64 million going to the Bendix company or someone, whomever. Um, maybe it's Boeing, maybe it's uh, whoever. All right, uh, so they sign off on that, but they don't have the permission or the right or the clearance for these top secret inquiries. They cannot find out where the money goes. The senators and congressmen that represent us do not know, are not privy to where these covert operative monies go to. And this is, by the way, I'm not even getting into the, the criminal side, uh, like the narcotics connected operation to the central intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm not even getting into that, but strictly on the leg what we might call legitimate covert operations. And a surprise to myself also was, although once I understood it, it, it became rather clear, but there are approximately four to ten levels of secrecy above the president's office. So you actually have secrecy levels in our government where people cannot even look at a piece of paper, all right, relative to an operation, uh, that literally are above the level of the President of the United States. So it's, it is very possible that huge, outrageous, unbelievable, not just theft, but uh, operations and uses of money that can never even be looked at by the President because it's an ongoing, let's say, a development of a weapon or a group of weapons for example, that uh, had started two years before the president came in, 
The president's going to be there for four years, and it may run the um, uh, studies or whatever, manufacturing and, and testing of that weapon, may run three years past the president's tr uh, reign in office. So therefore, you don't necessarily want them to know about it. All right, and I'm just giving a logical reason for for an extraordinarily interesting situation. So I started snooping around. The problem that I had was, where did this money go to? And it's continually to disappear in huge amounts. And it had been vanishing like this for at least 25, 30 years since approximately, well, of course, it always had been, but not like this in the big numbers, since about 83 to 85, which was approximately the time that I had been first exposed to all this criminality. So the question was, Bob, where does the money go? And uh, do we have to take a break now? Uh, no, we're not there yet. We still okay. Give me a heads up on that. All right, um, we, we've got another half hour before we hit the break. So okay, so here's where we were. We were in a situation where we understood there was extraordinary funds disappearing, but then I also understood and realized that you just can't money launder a trillion dollars. I mean, if you had sixty billion, you can't money launder sixty billion. Least of all, a trillion. So where would that kind of money go? Where would the money, where would the gold out of Fort Knox disappear to? All right? So that, that you know, I mean, it's extraordinary. Uh, so all of, so I, I put feelers out. I started doing some research in a lot of different directions. And I remembered one guy, a fellow that had come to me and sent me photographs and some films, actually, uh, actually videotapes at that time, back in 1994 five in that area time uh, about underground facilities that had been built underground in the United States and that he had driven made truck deliveries and said uh, told me said you know you're not going to believe this but I drove into a facility in Texas and and came up uh, ended up making my delivery in Louisiana and I said I said what do you mean and he said I drove underground about 800 to 1,000 miles. And he's talking about underground highways. And he had sent me videos and photographs. At that time, I was up to my neck in other things uh, of all sorts. Uh, and, I, and it was just something like, I don't even understand this or what, you know, I mean, it was just way over my head at that time, just trying to keep going with what I was doing. As I was testifying to the Intelligence Committee on drugs and, and on uh, uh, covert operations that were criminal, murders, assassinations, uh, and as a matter of fact, I had completed an, in, uh, an in-depth investigation for Congressman Sonny Bono. I had delivered it to him. We worked together, he, his office and myself, uh, for about eight or nine months, maybe a year almost, and he finally contacted me, and uh, in... Um, uh, I was living in California. They contacted me and they said, we're ready to go right after the Christmas holidays. We're going to have your inquiry that was directly related to the central intelligence and the White House connections into drug smuggling and assassinations. And I was, I was elated. I was excited because the Congress, his Sonny had set up to where he was going to have the ability to have subpoena powers, which means the people that were going to be brought up to talk about this couldn't just say, I don't know, I don't remember, I, you know, that's above my level, or somebody else will have to answer the question. They couldn't sidestep it because they were going to be forced under the subpoena powers that they were going to be obligated to answer the question, or they could be put in jail until they answered the question. Commonly, subpoenas are not, uh, subpoena power is not involved with Congress and Senate investigations. Sonny had set it up, we were ready to go, and 10 days later, he was murdered on the top of the ski slopes, pistol whipped to death, dragged up against a tree, and told by everybody that uh, he had died with a stupid accident, running into a tree and banging his head on the tree and dying. That's completely a lie, and I did a separate investigation. If people are interested in that, uh, I'm going to give you my address. I want to grab up a pencil and paper, write down my address. Um, for those of you who are computer savvy, uh, some of you, I know some of my older friends are not involved with it. Uh, I'm going to give a regular mailing address for those of you who are not on the computer and want to get some of our reports. Uh, they're all available on DVDs. They're all investigations that I was directly involved with and not 
externally looking at. Uh, but the uh, it's Bob Fletcher, Post Office Box 216, Bayview, Idaho. That's Box 216, Bayview, Idaho, 83803. 83803. If you want to write me a note, drop me a note, um, and I will return to you our uh, a little catalog sheet shows you what, what's available to you so that you can go over these things that I'm talking about. They're extraordinary. Um, and they include um, people from the CIA being named by names with the biggest drug smuggler on earth originally out of uh, Cambodia and Burma, that area, um, uh, those, uh, actually the military generals naming the names all the way up to the White House of the people that were buying the drugs back uh, a few years back. Uh, I mean, it's a mind-boggling investigation. That's part of uh, Sonny's uh, inquiry. All right, but now you guys that are on computer, my website is new, excuse me, the, um, it's bobfletcherinvestigations.com. It's BobFletcherInvestigations.com. Go on the computer, and you can uh, locate my uh, website there. It's got, um, matter of fact, it has pictures and everything and movie, a little bit of some footage uh, of several of these projects I'm talking about. Now, okay. let me get back to where we were at. All right. So this fellow tells me, uh, and again, now this is going back into my, to, to the old days, so to speak, in 95. I looked at the pulled-out pictures and films that he had sent, and son of a gun, what I ended up discovering, I'm going to speed forward a little bit here, what I ended up discovering that we had built around, beginning in, uh, well, some of them were already underway, but uh, the big movement started about 1983, when apparently the news had come in to the White House that there was a Planet X, and there was a Nibiru planet that was headed apparently back in to circle the sun one more time. Prior to that, prior to that, of course, it was always, it was kind of like, I don't know, it, nobody was sure. Some people that were astronomers um, thought it was out there. Some people didn't think it was out there. Some people um, uh, had spent an entire lifetime studying this. But it was not until 1983 when the Reagan-Bush administration uh, had sent out into outer circles of our own solar system the first infrared telescope that could send back pictures. And apparently, that was the period of time in 1983 when it was realized that this planet was existence and kind of head back in. Now, the, the underground facilities had been started to be seriously constructed right around that period of time, and, and many things changed. Many things changed in Congress and in the Senate and in the, the projections and their budgeting. And they eliminated a lot of things from NASA. They changed and switched around. They started talking about a thing called Star Wars, which was to create uh, some kind of weapons or, and telescopes and systems to keep track of. Uh, actually, they were telling us it was the missiles that Russia, Red China might launch. The reality it was that they were sending them out to do serious studies on the incoming potential of Planet X. So what we had was uh, uh, what apparently they, they decided to do, and this is where the money went. I figured it out finally, that track where it would go. They had constructed over the years 100 underground facilities in the United States of America. These are survival hideout locations for the elite, the criminally oriented elite of some of the highest levels of our government. Uh, and some of them are big enough to handle eight to 10,000 people. Some of them are for smaller uh, numbers, but nonetheless, most of them can handle 1,000 or two. And of course, these are the wealthy, elite, separate, uh, separated uh, personalities that control all the criminality out of our, our government. They have been supplying them via railroad cars actually with train cars running into under the, under the ground, into the granite mountains, if you will, into subterranean cities located all over in the most logical places in the United States. And they include a railroad system with magnetic levitated trains that can move almost at the speed of sound. They travel at 400 miles an hour underground. There's, of course, no intersections or anything, so they just, once you're in them, you just push the go button and, and zap, 
you're going um, uh, magnetically levitated uh, 400 miles an hour, so you're in your next location pretty quick. They have developed underground nursery uh, growing situations underground where they uh, not only have brought in foodstuffs, survival foods, over the last years, but they have manuf uh, manufactured and created a manner by which they are able to grow food substances underground in many of the locations. And again, most of them, or many of them, are interconnected in the tunnels underground. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds, that's amazing to a lot of people, maybe if there's, I think everybody sort of had heard stories about the um, uh, underground operations and facilities at the Denver airport. All right, that's true. Uh, many years ago in the 90s, I was down underground and had actually videotaped and taken pictures of some of the underground operations at the Denver airport. But that's not, uh, that's, that's one location. And, and, and again, we have Bob, approximately, Bob, yes. What, where, are, where are those videos today? Because I know people would love to see them. Are they still around? They're available, everything that I'm talking about. All right, now, uh, this is, this is um, going to surprise people, I guess. Everything that I'm talking about today, uh, and, and I will be talking about here in the next hour or so, uh, a couple of hours, is uh, available. They are on the new DVD that I had finished and completed. The DVD we have, it's called Incoming. That's the title of it. It uh, covers every aspect of the uh, Planet X and every aspect, <laughs> I can't even talk, uh, every aspect to the how they, they build them. I have films from the underground facilities. I have still photographs of the underground facilities, not only in the United States, but in Red China and in Russia. The Russians have several thousand underground facilities that were completed and um, ready to go, so to speak, uh, in the uh, last years, uh, the last months of 2014 and 13. Uh, they had finalized, uh, for the most part, the building between 2010, which is when they announced they were going to do it, they said in 2010 they were said they were going to complete 5,000 underground facilities by in five years, and they had completed it in uh, 2014 around that period of time. Uh, they had most all of them done. One of the ones in Russia is large enough to accommodate over 50,000 people underground. The Red Chinese have thousands of them also themselves. They have been putting together underground facilities at the same time. And the European nations, several of them are cooperatively have created underground facilities also. Here's what we're looking at, folks. The realization at the upper crust of the major nations of the world in approximately uh, 1983, around that point, period in time, at that point, it was understood and realized that Planet X, Nibiru, or Wormwood, as it's called in the Bible, was out there, was real, was coming back, and they secretly, covertly have been constructing underground facilities around the globe. Now, a few years back, in 2012, the group of, uh, these, these basically it's kind of a, a, a mutual construction situation here, where they know we're doing it, we know they're doing it, et cetera, et cetera, and each one is doing it for the salvation of the limited few aristocratic elite at the top of each one of these governments. Now, in 2012, they got together uh, as a uh, cooperatively, a, a matter of fact, an interesting global thing. They got together and they built what's called uh, a seed vault, S-E-E-D, a seed vault. Mm -hmm. It is uh, in the Norway, Denmark area, on an island, actually, just I think it's closer. Actually, it's a, it is a Norway island in the middle of the, um, uh, the Norwegian Sea there between Russia uh, and, and Norway itself. And they built cooperatively in 2012. It was finished, and it contains every known growing seed of, actually not just one, obviously, but uh, there's billions of seeds in, in the seed vault. And it is a under the ground, into the side of a mountain, uh, deep freeze vault for all the growing seeds of the globe so that they can reseed the face of the earth after Nibiru 
or uh, other galactic type of a problem was to come. They didn't want to tell anybody. It was Nibiru specifically, uh, and they're not going to tell anybody. But the bottom line is now, if you have a computer, you can go on and you Google Seed Vault Norway, and you will get it, and you can see it yourself, the picture location, uh, all the rest of that. Now, all of this is also in our DVD. The DVD that I'm talking about, by the way, this complete study on this thing, everything that you would ever that I'm not going to answer tonight because there's not enough time, but every question that might come to your mind, I'm going to guarantee you it's answered in the um, DVD set. And this is huge. Now, the DVD is, is two DVDs of two hours each. It's a four-hour library of information on this subject and literally answers every possible question. The involvement of the Vatican. The Vatican, by the way, got on, came on board a few years back, and they had, under their name, they went into Arizona, and the Vatican had built one of the largest infrared telescopes that was available at that time, not counting the ones that the United States government had secretly put up on a couple mountainsides around the globe. But the Vatican owns a infrared uh, telescope in Arizona. And uh, by the way, the title of it, the name of that, this should bother the average Christian out there, the name of the telescope is Lucifer, and that's uh, the Vatican's name for the telescope itself. Yeah, and now somebody told me that, uh, well, they just happened to uh, rent a telescope by that name, but I'm thinking, why would the Vatican have anything to do with anything with that name, right? Well, would... that's the point, <laughs> they, and the point is, you know, I don't want to get into, uh, you know, the Vatican right. has been involved with every major covert activity coming out of the CIA since 1938. Uh, you know, they were involved with things with the Nazis and whatever that you wouldn't even want to know about. Nobody would ever want to admit. I'm not going to get into that at all. But the bottom line is, that is the name of it. And uh, if there's one that's available now for retail people to buy called that, it's just taken off the name of the ones in, a in Arizona. Again, go to the computer, write in Vatican Arizona Telescope Lucifer, and it'll come up. Period. All of this stuff is completely there and everything I'm telling you is completely shown including internal underground pictures of the facilities in the United States not all of them obviously all right now uh, I do have an in interesting section on it there's people that said how in the world do they build these how could they build these facilities so fast that you're talking about some of them like a few thousand in a couple of years in Russia how do they do that? How's Red China doing all of these, the extraordinarily one, ones that they have? All right? We have drills. Actually, now the, the, the globe, the whole, everybody, uh, Russia, Red China, and the United States and Europe, they all have them now. We have drills so large, and I show a whole bunch of them in the DVDs, the pictures of them uh, digging the holes themselves. The, bo the bottom line is we have drills that drill into the side of a mountain, and can back out, go a couple miles a day, back out, and you can drive uh, an 18-wheeler, and in some of them, you could drive two 18-wheelers next to each other in the size of the hole that they make with a single wipe of these drills. An amazing one that I show in our DVD set uh, is the one that the Chinese have. It's their own. They're making them themselves. Of course, they, half of them, this stuff, you know, they just steal uh, what, what we've done and, and go ahead and do it. <laughs> Some cases, they do it themselves, and, and we steal their ideas back from them. But the bottom line is the Chinese have one single drill that literally is three of these gigantic drills next to each other across, all right, one, two, three, and plunges into the side of a mountain and digs these tunnels that are big enough for four 18-wheelers to drive into the hole after they've dug them out. It's mind-boggling. Uh, the, the, the size of the underground facilities done by the Russian and the Chinese, and probably a couple of our own, are big enough to where they are storing small fleets of aircraft. The Red Chinese have 3,000 nuclear weapons full-size missiles stored inside and underground and entire battleships and submarines stored underground in these facilities. Now, that's not necessarily the primary point of it. The primary point is salvation of 
the limited elite at the highest level of the governments of these different nations, including the United States. I have um, one notification. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me backtrack a little bit before I get into that part of it. Okay. And then I'm going to get into Nibiru itself, some of the information about the the, the returning of this uh, uh, of the planet. All right, and we got about five minutes for, uh, about okay. three minutes okay. to a break. All right, good. Well, uh, what I will mention uh, at, at this point in time is that the, um, uh, what I found out they had, and now, see, now you understand when we're talking billions of dollars just to build these underground facilities and billions of dollars to put mag levitated railroad cars in it and billions of dollars doing these literally connected highways and and facilities sufficient to keep thousands of people alive for an unknown period of time maybe a hundred maybe fifty years well it makes sense where the missing money you know, Absolutely, gone. and so, so that was that was the aha moment when I realized all of this. And then there's then there's still an awful lot to come. But but when I realized that that we this literally all existed and that it has been underway for so many years. By the way, the same period of time, approximately eighty three, eighty four, whatever, uh, was when Ronald Reagan made that historic speech on the floor of the uh, United Nations, where he said. I wonder how all of our nations would come together if, in fact, we had a, an extraterrestrial threat to the globe. And this was done on the floor of the, the United Nations by Ronald Reagan. And everybody kind of turned and looked at each other like, what is, what's he talking about? This is exactly what he was talking about. And a short time after that was when everybody was notified, by the way, you guys better start digging holes to... to um, for you and your family, because this is what's going to happen. Um, now, the um, uh, as far as I, I'm trying to trying to hit on some of the most important things, because we can't cover everything. Right. Oh, some some of the other things. Well, I want to save the rest of the the Nibiru and the, the some of the fine points about that uh, for a little bit later. Okay. Oh, the the big deal is this: during a period of time, let's say going back straight ten years back, many companies that retail dealers and sales of uh, survival foods, freeze-dried foods, the dehydrated foods, and the foods that can last for 10 or 30 years, many of them a year, well, actually going the last five years, couldn't get orders. They couldn't get their, they were ordering, but they were being backlogged. They were being told, they were being backordered. They were being told, we can't ship that for another 90 days. We can't do this. We can't do because the U.S. government had contracted and had obligated 95% of everything they produced, every major company that did freeze-dried products were shipping to the government because they were filling the underground facilities with the survival foods that were going to last 10 or 30 years. And it were, you couldn't even, even uh, companies like Walmart, you know, it's just like, like, you know, that's a big company, and they had contractual obligations and they, because they sell it on the floor, retail, but if you go through there, you'll find there's only a few cans. You go to a Walmart store, and they have this whole section there, and, it, and it's like they got like 35 cans and a few boxes of, uh, of freeze-dried stuff because they couldn't get it, and they have, they're still not able to get it like they want to because, in fact, it's going underground to the underground facilities in the United States. Now, uh, I did... I, uh, right away, I'm trying to think of the random connections because I'm going to get into the serious part about Nibiru when we come back from the break here. Okay. Um, all right, but, yeah, because uh, we're, 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 we're about due here, Bob, so we better... Okay. All right, so let's hit that break, and then we'll come back and, and talk some more. Uh, so just hang on the line. We'll be a few minutes, uh, everybody. My guest is Bob Fletcher, and uh, we're talking about Planet X. I, I've I've given him the floor. I've allowed him to give the backstory and and work his way up to it because that's what I do. I mean, he's got some information to share with you. I think you should get it, and uh, and you're getting it uninterrupted. How about that? So uh, so we are going to take a break. I do want to make a quick comment, uh, however. Uh, we had uh, a gentleman in our chat room a little while ago. He he's a a gentleman who's been in our chat room for quite a long time. Somebody who's listened to the show, even been a guest. Um, nobody's safe. Uh, when I listen, uh, when you put links in my chat room, this is my chat room. I own it. Okay. When you put links in my chat room for a guy who has done nothing but put disinformation out there about me and many others. 
and I'm so, and I ask you not to promote that in my chat, and you can become a wise ass because of it. Guess what? You're you know I don't need you. I'm trying to tell people this. You know if if you're going to be if you're going to be a moron and you're going to follow information like an Ed Cherini, are you kidding me? You're going to follow an idiot like that, a guy who has absolutely no brains. He's an FBI puppet. And then you're going to put that stuff in my chat room and expect me to just take it? I don't, okay? So it's not censorship. It's intelligence, okay? So you can call it whatever you want, but I'm not going to allow you to promote somebody who attacks me. That is not happening. Ed Trini is a shill, and I've exposed him on Late Night in the Midlands before, and I'm done with that scene. If you want to go over there and, and think the whole world is a Hollywood actor, then you go right ahead, but you're not going to do it in my chat room. So that's it. It was nice knowing you, my friend. This is Late Night in the Midlands. We'll be back in just a few moments. Czar, even though, you know, I'm right. I'm, I'm I'm right a lot. I'm certainly right about Ed, and I'm certainly right about not wanting that disinfo in my chat. So I had to go and block some things because people just don't, they, they can't take rejection. They'll, they'll continue to come back, and, you know, I've been a great guy for months and months, and I'm always a great guy when I let people be guests on my show and do all those things that I do. But as soon as I lay down a law, as soon as I say how, you know, somebody's disinfo, they don't like it, you know, all of a sudden, and then, and then I stop them from promoting that garbage um then all of a sudden i'm a, I, i'm a bad guy now so but i'm used to it it's okay i don't mind um you know say what you will uh but uh, no that that guy can't be promoted not in my chat nowhere where i am because that's just it's ridiculous i mean we might as well be we might as well be promoting barney and and, and all that good stuff too you know i love you you love me stuff we might as well be doing that if you're going to promote uh chikini uh, whatever his name is there. Uh, if you go, but hey, if you do go to the guy he's promoting, you go check out that website or, or even type in. I don't want to promote the guy, but even if you type in, you can see he's got down there where I'm an actor and that, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'm Adam Walsh's kid, or I am Adam Walsh, he says, uh, and that I didn't get my head cut off and now I'm playing the part of this. And hey, the guy's in a fantasy line. You're going to promote that stuff? Come on. Let's, let's get real. All right. So anyways, at least you're listening. So I thank you for still tuning in. Um, but anyhow, we're going to get back to things that are much more important, like my guest. So uh, let's do that. Bob, we are back. And um, so you wanted to hit the, the Nibiru uh, area. Right. And I, I think yeah, we're ready well, for that. I say that there's so many parts to this. See, And when I got into it again, I... I had to really move carefully with this. I, you know, you say I'm a guy that, uh, you know, got phone calls on a regular basis from senators and congressmen and intelligence people and uh, blah, 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 and, and, you know, been directly there, and I can't be putting my name uh, on something that's just plain old, uh, you know, is too far out. And, when, and originally, you know, if somebody just said, hey, what do you know about Planet X, you know, let's say five, ten years ago, I would have just said, I don't know anything about it, I'm not an astronomer, uh, you know, don't... Don't even ask me. I'm a researcher, and a few things may have crossed my paths a few years back that, that uh, mentioned that or was involved with that. But I'm not an astronomer, so don't don't even put put don't even ask me a question. If I can't answer it, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna make something up. And so, uh, for me to really put this together, and by the way, I spent three years on this thing, um, an unbelievable amount of research, and tapped into people that I knew. You know, some people that spent spent uh, 30 years of their lives being involved with it. So, but the, with the Planet X and Nibiru thing, like you say, the way I discovered it was starting to chase money that, that was illogical, the amount of money that was vanishing. Uh, and, and, and there's even more. As a matter of fact, I want to point this out. Um, because there's other areas. I want to get into the astronomy, the science, and the religious side and the proof, evidence, documentation on this uh, that was the straw that broke my back and, and forced me to uh, obligate myself to put this thing together, uh, this, this report, all right, because it's entirely too... Um, I was familiar with the politics of secrecy, which has just eaten up the United States of America. People have no idea the stuff that's going on with our money, which is only part of it, but with our lives. I mean, these people are keeping things secret that, that are, uh, I mean, it's a, unto itself it's a sin. Uh, and, and I don't pretend to be a, 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 not a preacher, uh, you know, not a, not a student of a seminar, but uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's 
it's mind-boggling what they've been doing with the, under the banner of secrets, top secret, and above top secret, and classified. It's disgusting. They're stealing the, all of the blood. It's like a vampire. They've drawn the blood out of the United States of America, and, and uh, we were just beat to death with this thing. Now, there's a whole multitude of things that are interconnected with the Nibiru starting to cap come back through. Now, according to those people who have studied this for a career, all right, have made a lifetime work out of it, and there's many of them, there's a few groups and organizations, but a couple of them float to the top as being people that are, are, are n not fools, they're not stupid, and they are uh, astronomers or scientifically oriented enough so that they actually could speak intelligently on, on this potential problem. All right, to describe Nibiru itself, uh, first off, it's, it's, it is supposedly, uh, and this is uh, analytical astronomy studies of uh, gravitational effects, things going on out um, in the farther reaches of the planets and, and what have you, uh, that it's approximately um, uh, said to be five to seven times the size of Earth in dimensional size. It has uh, reportedly four to five moons of its own circling it. And it goes out. Uh, now, there's two different, there's two different uh, thoughts on this. Uh, and both organizations, groups, etc., cetera, um, uh, have my respect and exactly which one proves to be correct on the, what I'm about to say. It actually, it doesn't make any difference. But there's a little uh, kind of a, a dispute on, on potentials here. Uh, and that is that uh, there, there's uh, Dr. Sitchin, who wrote many books about um, the uh, planet of Nibiru from his deciphering of clay tablets done 4,000 years ago. Uh, and they were um, uh, Sumerian clay tablets. There were thousands of these. He, he went over several, I think several, a couple thousand of them himself. There's 22,000 of these clay tablets that were written like a diary in the, in the Sumeria 4,000 years ago, I mean, written like a regular day-to-day -day diary of uh, the events uh, taking place in Sumeria. Okay. And they describe the passing of this huge planet that blocked the sun for a few days and then went back and disappeared back into the farthest reaches of outer space. And the description of all that he does, that's one very interesting source, but it's only one of the antiquated uh, old um, uh, scriptural uh, logging in or registration of this thing. The Tibetan monks have also written thousands of years ago the, the incoming and the passing of this planet. The Chinese, one fella, one gentleman, his name's Gil Broussard, and I fully respect his work on this. I think is probably the best, and he has spent years and years doing this uh, and studying it. He literally went to China and lived there for a while so that he could get into the old libraries of the emperors of China, going back over a thousand years. And when he went back and did his studies and spent living there for a while, he found out that they had logged in one of the passages of this Nibiru on a day-to-day -day basis, or like every three days. They logged it in. These were astronomers a thousand years ago at the command of the emperor. And if you made mistakes as being an, a, a serving uh, astronomer for the emperor in China a thousand years ago, he cut your head off. So it was not like these people were making stuff up. This was seen, it was written down, it was logged in and registered in at the angles and all of that, and they were already studying and following the stars. Going back several thousand years, there have been many cultures that were involved with stargazing, if you will uh, use that term, but really at an astronomical, uh, a poorly uh, informed, obviously, they didn't have the education that we have now. They didn't know exactly what they were looking at, but they certainly could describe it and they could describe the events. And uh, Gil Broussard uh, had, had gone and done a magnificent relationship, not only of these other uh, foreign scriptures, the writings of emperors of a thousand years ago, but the biblical relationship. 
and all of these in the Bible that describes us to the T, including, of course, in Revelations, which describes what will take place when it comes passing close by. It's not going to hit the earth. It is, uh, that's not going to happen. But the gravitational effect on it and the fact that it will be dragging a tail behind it of an extraordinary length and uh, the width approximations, the width of the diameter of this planet coming in, going around the sun and then back out, it will, we want to pass through on our normal rotation around the sun. We will pass through that tail two times. Now, before I get in much farther on that, uh, I want to tell you the reality of what's already taking place that is the effect in my school and other, how many thousands there are out here, other school people that have studied this whole effect of this thing. All right, I put in the DVD. I predicted when we put the DVD out first time, our, the, the double DVD, when we put that out, it was made first time available approximately the first of this year. So it's six months, seven months ago. And in it, I, I did predictions with everybody said, oh, you shouldn't do that. See, if you, you, know, if you make a prediction and it's not right, you know, then you look like a jerk. I said, well, if you look at the whole thing, you're going to realize I'm not a jerk. And whether they all come exactly about as it appears scientifically it will, well, then uh, it's going to happen. And one thing was, I said it was going to affect the weather, that the weather on the entire globe starting last year at the beginning of this year uh, was going to be uh, never going to be the same again. It's already going to affect the weather in a very short period of time. And, and Bob, we got a question from the chat. Um, uh, this listener asked, does Bob know if the Anunnaki or other inhabitants are coming with this system? Okay. Uh, I, I un no, I don't know. I will say one thing. Uh, see, in part of, uh, of, of uh, Sitchin's writings uh, included, of course, uh, the, the talking about the Anunnaki, that it was part of the Anunnaki putting together the, um, the clay tablets themselves, etc., and that these were supposedly a, uh, an alien group uh, coming off of possibly one of the moons that's traveling with uh, and around the um, uh, Nibiru, or Planet X. Um, I don't know, but I will, let's, let's, if you, you read any of uh, Sitchin's works, you realize basically what is said in there, because a lot of people said, well, you know, maybe the aliens are going to help us, maybe they're going to prevent it, maybe they're going to change the direction or do something like that. Um, they did not do anything 4,000 years ago to assist us. I don't know if they, I don't know anything about that. I'm not going to, I'm not a mystic, I'm not a psychic or any rest of that. I'm dealing strictly with factual events. And I um, appreciate that. They, what, what, what Sitchin implied was that those persons that were, uh, on, that were on the earth and, and, and did their, their kickstart on humanity, so to speak, uh, uh, you know, that they, realizing Nibiru was coming back, they got in their spacecraft and got out of town. They left, and they did nothing to help anybody, okay? So um, those people that say, oh, I think maybe they're really good guys, I do believe, absolutely, there are probably so many alien planets with life on them, we couldn't, you couldn't even begin to measure them. And uh, they have done mathematical potentials of it, and it's beyond, it's, the numbers are outrageous. You know, there's just too many planets for anybody to say that we are the only people occupying this, because we're pretty stupid so far at this point in time right. in terms and, of humanity. And, and, and I, I, you know, there's uh, some discussion going on about good ETs, bad ETs. I think that, you know, while some think that there's some good who want to help uh, help us, I, I believe that there are also those that uh, are helping the wrong side, I, you know, and and, well, and, and... and we don't know what side that is either, you know, right. when you look at it from a total universal point of view, you know, uh, we 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 don't have enough information to make a, even a good judgment on it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I do. Now the I uh, I think there's there's all kinds of good guys and all kinds of bad guys out there. Uh, and and I, I think if we just take a sampling of Amer of of the the humans human humans on the face of the earth, we got good guys and bad guys. We have some people that are so despicable uh, that, that it's unbelievable. We're watching some things going on with ISIS. That, it, that is so disgusting that it's, it's hard to even imagine. 
okay? And then we have people uh, that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, never did something on purpose that was, uh, that was wrong uh, uh, in their lives. They never planned to do a bad thing in their lives. And I think you are got to take that same sampling, whatever that percentage is on Earth, it probably is throughout the universe. And also you have to remember there's, there's more than likely, gosh only knows, a gazillion planets with people 10 million years ahead of us and probably the same number of unknown planets with an, a life on it that are 10 million years behind us. And someplace in the middle is probably where Earth falls. Now, let me get away from that and get back to the, some of the interesting stuff. Okay. The bottom line was, uh, on, in the DVD, I said, one thing's going to happen uh, unless, unless I'm, I'm wrong. And if I'm wrong, uh, I would admit it. Um, the, the bottom line is, I said that uh, earthquakes and volcanoes were going to increase like crazy. Right? They already have. When I did studies on this, I found out also that the planets, the nine planets, or whatever number we have now, starting from Pluto coming in, have been heating up. The temperatures being measured has been altered on all of them, changing in varying degrees. The scientists don't know why, or that's what they're telling us. They don't know why the atmospheric storms on some of these planets, whether you call it an atmosphere or not, the surface storms and volcanic activity and things of that sort are also taking place on these planets, and they don't know why. They, a couple of them have switched their north and south poles or have altered, have deviated, or have deviated in their normal orbits, are wiggling, jiggling in their orbits. They don't know why, all right? Now, as Nibiru comes back in from the very farthest reaches out, all right, as Nibiru heads back in, uh, it's striking and doing things like a bowling ball going through bowling pins. And I, in, in the DVD, I said, you can watch for an increase in the, um, uh, uh, an, an increase in the deaths of animals and fishes and all of that. Remember, that's been going on for about four years, birds falling out of the sky. And unless you study that, you don't know how many, and, and on a global basis, how much of that's going on. It has increased progressively. The numbers are in the millions of millions of fish and birds and big animals and small animals, just plain dying. They're calling it this thing or that thing, but they really don't know. And what they don't understand is that a lot of it is electromagnetic force variations in our solar system being caused by Nibiru headed back in. Now, I put on there also, I may have put a little section in it about the fact that the glaciers are melting like crazy, big time. They're melting from what appears to be predominantly underneath the glaciers themselves, all right? They are, uh, the, there's a brand new study, they're only out a few months, it was finalized, it's a couple of years, and they came back from the Antarctic after being down there three or four years in succession. They came back and they said, the melting of the Antarctic snow, ice, frozen cap of the Antarctic, is at a non-reversible stage. All of it will melt. It is melting six to eight times faster than it ever has before. And it is, all of that water is going in and causing variations in the temperature and in the saline, the salt count in the ocean. It's varying the salt count as well. Now, the combinations of heat from under, listen to what I'm going to say now, from under the ocean volcanic activity that has cranked up in the last two years, the heat variation with that has changed our weather patterns completely. Not only is it doing that, but the water that I was talking about coming from the ice caps predominantly the Antarctic is the biggest one of, of concern, uh, is, has raised the water in Miami Beach on a regular high tide every day. Now listen to what I'm saying now. Every day in Miami, the water from high tides are now going as much as five blocks into the city of Miami Beach. And a year ago, give or take a couple months, they went in and put millions of dollars of water pumps in Miami Beach to pump the water. Every high tide automatically kicks in, 
to prevent it from destroying multi-billions of dollars of businesses because the water has raised that high on the coastline of Miami. And this thing is not even close to being here yet, folks. And uh, it, it, is, it is a long-term, it is a long-distance effect of the, the, the planetary effects of this thing uh, within our solar system. Now, uh, what I want to get into, uh, that everybody always wants me to get into this early, but I'm not going to do it, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and that is describing some of the potential, um, uh, not only the actual effects when it gets close and as it comes in and what the worst of it will be. Uh, the, um, uh, and, and I have to mention something. Many people, including astronomers, that, have, um, have, that are at the level where they know about this, and may shoot their mouths off about it, have been terminated. And it includes, a couple years ago, uh, a group of astronomers who visited, uh, had a meeting together with themselves uh, to discuss this in, I believe it was Switzerland. Uh, and uh, they were in a gondola, and the cable broke, and 12 of the most important people doing studies on this uh, were, were dead in about uh, a 15-second fall. In the over the Alps, all right. We have a lot of other people that are at the highest levels of intelligence and potentially have been removed, going back to the 80s and the 90s on this, where they may have known the plan for the underground facilities for the limited few, and the plans for those people to go underground with our taxpayers' bucks, close the door behind them, and tell us lots of luck. And uh, you know we'll we'll send you a, t a cable. <laughs> the bottom line is anybody that um, came forward and has the credibility. See now I'm just a guy out here. It's easy to make fun of me or whatever, you know, and say oh whatever, you know he's what does he know and all that, uh, you know that's easy, all right. But if someone uh, like Princess Diana knew about it or somebody like that, and all of a sudden they were gone, the heads of the CIA, the major. Uh, elderly heads that had retired have all died under suspicious circumstances, yeah. starting with Bill Casey in the 80s, who was at the desk in 83 when Ronald Reagan would have been presented with the intelligence information on Nibiru. He retired, uh, or he didn't, get to, he didn't get to retire. 1985, he was in the middle of the Iran-Contra investigations, told a friend of mine, mumbled to my friend who was literally in the offices up there, he said, I'm going to talk next time I'm up, I'm going to clear this, I'm tired of all of this stuff, I'm going to clear this sleep. The following day, he drank his coffee and had a stroke and never regained consciousness. And by the way, they gave him as procedural medicine when he arrived at the hospital, they gave him a lobotomy so he would never be able to talk again even if he survived. Wow. And of course, he didn't survive, he never got out of the hospital. Uh, two other central intelligence agents, uh, excuse me, the chiefs of CIA had retired, and both of them died under circumstances uh, very extraordinary. Uh, there's a long list. I'm not going to get into all well, of it. And, and a fellow who had become a friend of mine um, had uh, spoken, his uh, had done speaking engagements with myself um, alongside of me in uh, several different, um, uh, on, on several occasions. Uh, he had been talking, he actually was an engineer, uh, engineer that had worked on 13 of the underground facilities himself. He went out, was talking, um, same period of time back in the 90s when I was on the road a lot. We did several uh, uh, meetings together, uh, public meetings, uh, exposés, uh, if you will, and uh, his name is Phil Schneider. Uh, he came to me at one point in time and he said, uh, Bob, uh, I want you to have some of my books because I'm afraid they're going to kill me before, uh, before too long. Uh, I'm positive. He said, I've got people been following me for the last month or so. And actually, while we were there, I think it was in Denver, if I remember correctly, um, there actually were vehicles that were behind us and, and people showing up at restaurants that um, certainly were tailing him. Uh, anyhow, uh, about two weeks uh, now it wasn't that, it was two months, about 60 days after the last time we were together, uh, he was murdered. Uh, and... Uh, they said he had committed suicide, which was um, ridiculous. Anyhow, Phil Schneider was murdered, the guy they used to build. He did the design. He did the uh, geological designs on, on the best way to build some of these underground facilities during his career. 
and when he came out and finally uh, had to come out and talk about it, uh, they eliminated him. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, uh, I want to get back to uh, the big point that uh, a lot of people want to know. Uh, well, I'm not going to do it yet, as a matter of fact. It's another important point I want to get to. That is the um, uh, people, people have been wondering why uh, the, the sheriff and the police departments all over the United States for actually, and it goes back to the 90s, because I was aware of it in 95 uh, at that point in time when I was doing a lot of testimony uh, with Congress and Senate uh, that there was something fishy going on. There was all of this uh, armored personnel vehicles, uh, 50 caliber automatic machine guns, uh, hand grenade launchers, bazookas, flamethrowers, and of course military protective gear, but also huge amounts of uh, bullets and weapons and what have you uh, going to uh, the sheriffs and police departments all over the country. This is weapons that normally they don't use, don't need. Uh, I mean, they, they love them. You know, it's a, a typical police officer in Omaha, Nebraska. You know, if you said, hey, we're, you know, this our, our 27 guys, you're know, going to be able to get a, an armored car with a machine gun on it. Whoa, okay. So they love that stuff. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's been been available and been shipping in and they made a big stink of it here a few months back a year ago when the first of the this racially oriented um, dispute between police and the uh, black community uh, was surfacing so severely and it's still here uh, and a lot of that was uh, the shock when the crowd control was being done with the local police department driving their armored personnel vehicles with their machine guns and hand grenades into the, the community, and everybody would say, well, wait, what's, what's with that? Okay, let me explain what that is, all right? And by the way, it includes drones uh, for spying and all the rest of that as well. Yeah. Uh, and they're working now on small drones that can uh, uh, carry uh, automatic weapons uh, as well. Uh, so you could fly a drone into a crowd and, and, and pop off a few people and have it disappear, and it would be hard to figure out where it even came from. But the, um, here's the deal. And people ask me, they say, when, when are they going to tell us? When is the government going to tell us about this thing coming back in, this, this intergalactic or, or this celestial problem coming in? And uh, when are they going to tell us? Because we've got to know, right? The answer to that is no, that they are never, ever going to tell you that it's coming in. That will never happen, not from... Well, not from America. Now, whether somebody else uh, blows the whistle over in uh, Russia or Red China or something like that, I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, and this is being as much as secret as they possibly can maintain, uh, you know, the, the fact that it is coming back. And here's the reason. Stop and think about this for a minute. And this is the reason why the police stations around America now have more equipment than they know how to utilize. The, the moment... The moment that it becomes official, particularly if it was announced by a person of interest, of power, if it was officially announced that, let's just take a date, and they say 90 days from today, a planet's going to pass close by, and it's going to cause Noah's floods all over again on the face of the Earth as one problem. But it'll be coming in as a gravitational effect way beyond the moon it's also going to potentially flip the Earth 26 degrees on its axis. It's also going to block the sun two different times. First time coming in, second time going out. It's going to do that twice. And it's going to wreak havoc on the face of the Earth. Now, the moment that happens, if somebody tells you that, especially if it's, you know, my fellow Americans coming from a president, that kind of a speech, the entire globe will be lit up with riots and chaos beyond your wildest motion picture you've ever seen. Every person that has, that, that's one half an inch off from being a good uh, for, uh, Christian, a good humanitarian human being, anybody that's missing a few parts is going to go crazy in the streets. And unfortunately, when you go around the globe, that's an awful lot of them. And the, the amount of chaos would be beyond our imagination. So if the elite have spent all of the money they could possibly steal into these underground facilities, 
if they can't get down into them because of rioting that's so totally out of control, if they can't get down into their underground facilities ahead of time, what's the purpose? They're not going to be a single one of them's going to get into their little survival hideouts, all right? So they're never going to say it at all. These police and sheriffs had signed on with a little simple agreement that said if they are given the, the permission and have uh, the ability to, at a discounted price, get all of these weapons, all these exotic things, and uh, the armored vehicles, and the, the, the electronic weapons to control crowds. See, an awful lot of it is crowd control stuff. That's what it is, all right? And all of it is that they are obligated that if there is a national emergency with martial law, that they got to come on board without belly aching and jump on with the um, Homeland Security and the presidential mandate for martial law, when and if that happens. Now, nobody's being told that that's going to happen. They're just being told that if it happens, uh, you've got to take these exotic weapons that we put into your hands and bring them along to help out with the crowd control. So, number one, that's why they have been putting this stuff in these police forces way ahead of time, back in the 90s, and training them on the equipment, all the rest of it. Uh, and also, one of the reasons why the... That was the, loud. <laughs> Sorry about excuse that. Excuse me? I said okay. that, that was... It, it, it's also one of the reasons why over a million... Actually, originally it was a half a million, but now my understanding is passed uh, to a million. A million of uh, coffins were purchased a couple of years ago by the... Um, uh, uh, CDC in Atlanta, all right, the, the disease control under their banner, they bought over uh, back then, many several years ago, actually two, three years back, they bought a half a million, now it's up over a million and a half is my understanding, of coffins designed, plastic coffin containers designed for cremation and designed for four possible people to fit into them, uh, maybe two children and a couple of adults could fit into a single, and they're patented, patented specialized coffin containers that are built so as to not put out excessive residue when they're um, uh, put into a, a crematory oven. Uh, we have pictures of a half a million of these at the CDC's location in Atlanta, Georgia. That's included, in, of course, in the uh, DVD I was talking about. The, um, now, let me get back and move forward a little bit on uh, the, the problems that we're, we are going to have uh, as this thing. I covered some of the stuff that has already taken place. As we speak today, there's something like 35 to 45 volcanic eruptions taking place, full-blown eruptions while we speak. All right? Uh, there are earthquakes. The numbers of earthquakes are amazing. We had one two days ago in San Francisco. A, a fairly good size, 2.6 I think is what it was, something like that. Uh, big enough to shake people on and rock and roll. The earthquakes and volcanoes are interfaced. Uh, there is a stress going on the entire surface of the crust of the earth and has been uh, increasing on a regular basis. Uh, what that does, uh, and there's a great new study, one fellow that's actually been able to study it and understand it well enough uh, that when, the, when an earthquake takes place in three locations. It causes a, a given amount, obviously, a given amount of stress uh, on, on the surface. Uh, and this fellow has now figured out by triangulation that, in fact, uh, in three places where there are earthquakes, that there will be a volcano in a sort of a, like a triangulation situation with the stressing of the, uh, uh, of the crust. So what he has figured out that after a given amount of time, like two to five days, something like that, with earthquakes at A, B, and C, he can show point D where a volcano, volcanic activity will regenerate. And many of these volcanoes are very old, uh, thousand-year-old volcanoes that have been dormant for years and years and years. And now, because of the stress situation, Moving, movement of the crust itself and the plates, all right? We're getting earthquakes which are generating then volcanic activity. There's a volcano a few months ago that started to blow 
400 miles off the coast of Oregon. It's under the water. It is changing the temperature of the water. It is changing the fish direction, which is causing sharks. For now, you know, all of a sudden now we have shark bite, bites all over the place. Sharks are attacking uh, swimmers. They're doing that because they are in a place looking for food because the the fishes and the qu the krill and all of these uh, uh, surface fish that the uh, bigger fish eat have been moved. They are looking because of the temperature and the salt variations. They're going to different areas under the ocean. Now the sharks are showing up in different areas and they're eating people. And they're trying to figure out, gee, why are the sharks all of a sudden doing all of this? It's all related to the altering of the seabeds and the variation of temperature and saline account in the salt account in the oceans. Now, uh, I'm trying to hit on most important points of all of this stuff and make sure you get it in. Now, I'd be glad to answer any strange questions people might have. Okay. Uh, my friend, Gil Bruce Yard, uh, who, who I said had been, done such an extraordinary analysis of all of this, he has thousands of hours behind a telescope, and he has, again, years in terms of doing biblical and scriptural studies. And he's found that going back, uh, oh, and, and I had, there's a point that I didn't finish to make um, last hour uh, when I was talking about the size of the orbit, of whether it being 3,600 years or being less than that. There are two points of argument. Gil Broussard uh, feels that it's more like a 350, 360 uh, year cycle, an orbit of 360, 350. Now, if I'm misquoting him on anything, I apologize to Gil, but I don't mean to do that. But um, uh, to the best of my recollection, he's at this the uh, 350, 360 years. Now, the, the reason is that he's gone back into a study geologically, astronomically, and biblically, as well as scripturally in terms of other strange scriptures that may not normally be something that people look at. Uh, and he's found that the, all the information of given periods of time uh, <clears throat> of the global effect at one given point in time and the description of the foreign planet, the, um, the Chinese call it the visiting planet or the, or the red flying dragon as they watch it go around and back out and then go out again. Uh, and that's their description. Of course, it's in the Bible, it's written as wormwood. And in the revelations, the description in all of the revelations um, uh, that, that describe what will take place as this thing comes around and darkens the sun for a couple of days, uh, and uh, etc. And Gill has done the mathematics on this. And uh, again, he feels that in the... Th that the, the 3,600 year figure uh, was a figure that actually came uh, from uh, the um, uh, Dr. Sitchin's analogy uh, and his, his reading of the, uh, the clay tablets. However, there was not the use of, it may be a simple reason that there's a mistake here, 3600, 3,600 years, all right? There was no use officially of, of the zero. There was no zero numerically 4,000 years ago. It was 1,000 or 15 or 2,000 years ago when it was first introduced as a figure. In other words, they always would have said 300 times 6 times 4 plus 9 or something of that sort to come up with a full figure. They, wouldn't, they did not have what was a, just a zero for, for numbers. So the possibility of over the period of two or 4,000 years of that zero erroneously being put on there at the end of 360 might be where the 3,600 came from. But Gill's research brought him to come to the conclusion we were looking at a orbit of about 350, 360 years. And that would mean that this, this planet has swung around 360 years ago and then going back another 360 years and another 360 years. So in, in 3,600, it would have been here 10 times uh, and making it circle. It causes a tilt of the Earth of 26 degrees, apparently. This has been written scripturally several times that that was what happened. And it can be done, so it can be indicated 
by looking at the star locations and the constellations of people that had written down when it came around last, and you can go back and, and look at it. One of the most amazing, which I include in the DVD, one of the more amazing discoveries a while back was the discovery in Germany of what is called the sky disk or the star disk. This was during, done, actually created, if you will, manufactured or whatever you want to call it, but it was created during the Bronze Age in Germany at an excavated site similar to the uh, Stonehenge. And it was an astronomer's location where uh, 3,000 years ago they used to keep track of the movement of the stars. Now, what this is is a 12-inch bronze disk. Actually, it's a little bigger than 12. It's maybe 14 inches across. And it is highlighted and a drawing is done on this bronze disk and it's done in gold. All of the the uh, the drawing is done in gold itself. It's a uh, one man or another. It's impressed into the uh, the bronze disc itself. Now it shows. It indicates the blockage of the sun by a large planet, and it has several constellations uh, drawn. All the star locations and constellational uh, locations drawn uh, uh, in this particular, I call it a drawing, actually it's a, um, whatever you want to call it, maybe an engraving. It's sort of like a shield, as if it were a military shield, but it is not. I don't believe it was done that way. Uh, it's actually a, uh, if you will, uh, a, 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 like drawing on the sides of a cave, uh, but it was done at, uh, at the time when there was one of the, the passes, close passes of Nibiru. Now, a lot of people have looked at this as different things, but I carefully explain uh, where the uh, experts had come up with the concept that it is, in fact, a drawn picture of Nibiru's passing in Germany. This was discovered in Germany. Now, when you take modern-day astronomical computer programs, you can feed into those programs the location of stars and the location of constellations. And when you do that, you can come up with actually what amounts to being uh, the exact date and time of the engraving, when it was done, by just putting it into the computer program, it'll tell you when it was done. Well, apparently, this particular uh, engraving, uh, which is, which by the way, I have to show this in both a film and in still pictures. This engraving was done 3,600 years ago at 8:30 in the morning, and that's how exact we can be because of the star constellation locations. They actually are able to come up with the, uh, the, 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 the actual morning time of it, and apparently it was about, I think it was 8.30 in the morning when this thing was done. Now, what's strange or interesting about it is it shows a constellation on the bottom of this thing that should not have been seen in Germany at that time. So that was an incongruency. But then upon checking, other activities on the face of the globe at that time, it was discovered that the movement of Nibiru hits close passing by by its gravitational effects had literally moved the Earth 26 degrees on its axis. So we expect and anticipate the movement of the Earth by 26 degrees on its axis when Nibiru passes by. Now, by doing the mathematics, uh, on, a, on so many different times and places and the events that had taken place during those times, uh, Gil Broussard, and I completely respect his work, has come up with an approximate time that he expects for Nibiru to pass once again close by. Now, if you want me to hold, I don't know where we are on time for you um, on your break, because I'm going to tell everybody when the um, apparently the Nibiru will pass by. Yeah, let's let's take the break because we have one more, and then we'll come back and finish up. We'll okay. have about a half hour to go, and uh, you could get to to the when it's passing by. Uh, so hang on with us, Bob, uh, folks. This is late night in the Midlands. I'm Michael Vera. Bob Fletcher is my guest. He uh, 
He had a lot of information to get through. I've pretty much just uh, given him the floor uh, to do that, and so there you have it. Uh, but it ain't over yet. We still have a half hour to go, uh, weather permitting. We've we've been getting hit, hammered here with a, one hell of a, a storm. It's I see the lightning through the shades, I and the thunder is rattling my cage over here. But um, so far, so good. Knock on wood. It seems like we might get through this, and... Um, I've learned that there's, believe it or not, folks, I had no idea there's actually a hurricane that uh, could be on its way directly towards us here, and uh, so I haven't experienced that yet, but uh, anyways, a whole lot going on, and Planet X, it's on its way, according to some. If you have questions, you're more than welcome to call in after the break, or you can hit us in the chat room, private message those questions. And uh, this way I could get to him. So we'll be doing that. So <laughs> let's get back to it here. All right. My guest is Bob Fletcher. Uh, Bob, uh, you know, some people probably don't like what they're hearing tonight. But uh, you say that this is fact. And, and you know what? I, 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 I was saying at the beginning of the show, I couldn't argue with people who make the case this is what's happening right now with everything. Uh, why everything is so whacked. I guess you'd say. Uh, so, but anyways, uh, you wanted to get into Nibiru, where where it is, how long we might have before it gets here. Some are telling me December. Okay, yeah. The uh, <clears throat> according to uh, actually, the only person that's done what I would say, you know, really, uh, I, I shouldn't say the only person, but uh, there, there, of course, are thousands of people that are uh, astronomically more uh, skilled than I am. I'm not an astronomer. Um, the uh, the politics, you see, all the politics of this mess uh, it constantly comes in the same direction. It's pointing towards something of extraordinary situation is headed our way. Uh, they these people that normally manipulate money to to enhance their own wealth had all of a sudden changed and predominantly started spending our money to just preserve their lives and to be, uh, you know, uh, the, the seed vault thing. Again, see, this is, it's not just the United States, and it's not just one or two strange things going on for the last 10, 15 years. It's a multitude of strange things, and they all fit into a situation that, that apparently the wealthy elite have built underground hideouts throughout the globe, for themselves, and when the time comes, they're going to be gone, and the money's already gone. You know what? There's another little money thing that should bother people, and not a single person uh, in the political arena has even gotten into this like they should have, uh, and that is for 20 or th- actually more than that, but at least for th- 20 or 30 years, the federal government has not earmarked hardly any money to repair all of the infrastructure of the United States of America. They've hardly allocated anything. Now they throw a million bucks here, a hundred thousand on a little deal here, but all of the electronic generation of this country is at jeopardy just from an EMP, uh, the uh, uh, force, electromagnetic impulses coming from, uh, from the sun. Now, Nibiru has caused the sun to react already. It's already reacting crazy. With the holes generated on the face of the sun, they don't even understand them. Uh, Extraordinary, strange uh, pulses that have never happened before, things of that sort. Uh, That's taking place. I believe, and others believe, it's, again, just because of Nibiru. The weather is totally changed, all right? But the scientists have gone in before Congress 10 years ago and said that one good electromagnetic force from the sun can wipe out all of our generating ability, and it could shut us down for a a year or six months. Can you imagine no electricity for that period of time? I mean, none at all. Holy mackerel, folks. That's caveman time, right? Well, yeah, that's that's going back to the little house on the prairie days. That's right. Now, what happened, scientists came together and went on the floor of the Congress and requested, I think it was only $10 million dollars, for taking some of our primary generation, electrical generation points, and insulating them appropriately to deflect a big electromagnetic force. All right? I think it was 10 million. I mean, that's nothing. 
Okay, nothing at all. Trump could do it, right? Okay, out of his lunch money. Right. All right, <laughs> the point is, why aren't they, why have they spent nothing? Every, almost, I'm saying every, and that's not correct, almost every bridge, every underwater tunnel going into New York City, every bridge over the waters of San Francisco and over the, 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 in the, to New York, and every small tunnel and every small electrical generating system in America and every, every small bridge in the United States could be condemned today if they were properly inspected. But, of course, they can't do that, so they just let everybody run over them. But they're not fixing them, folks. Why are they not fixing anything? All of that stuff, all of those basic bridges, tunnels, railroads, railroad bridges, automobile bridges, almost every one of them are over 50 to 75 years old. And they are about to fall apart. They're not spending anything. Why are they not spending anything? Because they've taken that money along with everything else and put it down underground in their facilities because if this thing's coming in, why bother fixing them? Yeah, the infrastructure in this country is horrible. I know here in South Carolina it sucks. No, no, it's, it's the whole country, and it's so bad. I traveled around the country. I even was the candidate, um, and I'm going to say it, uh, on a Democratic ticket, but it had nothing to do with the Democrats, but I happen to be on the Democratic ticket. Uh, I ran for the Congress in 1990 in Orlando, Florida, running against a corrupted congressman down there. And I did uh, actually did extremely well, considering I had no money and no background, so to speak. But I ran and uh, came within nine points of, uh, of taking the seat. But that's another whole se separate story. Matter of fact, see, what people used to say, uh, if you're worried about the government, why don't you run for Congress? Well, I did. Okay, so uh, back at you, I guess, is the way to answer on that one. All right, now, let me get to uh, Nibiru. Uh, apparently, uh, because of the historic scriptural information, and I say scriptural using that in terms of old script, Himalayan monks on the top of the mountain, uh, biblical writings, writings uh, uh, of every sort you could imagine. The corresponding date and time of the passing of Nibiru has always been, as I'm about to say, visually seen. And by the way, one reason we can't find it uh, real quick, right away, people always say, why can't I see it? You know, uh, why can't we see it? Because it, it doesn't generate its own light. So until it becomes close enough to reflect the sun at the farthest point out, until it's close enough to reflect the sun, we will not see it. It is infrared. It, takes, it requires infrared telescopic vision to see the thing, okay? And it's also been, it goes way out into what's called the Oort cloud. You can look that up if you want, O-O-R-T cloud. It goes way out into the Oort cloud, which is a huge bunch of junk floating around in outer space that, in, that encircles our entire solar system. And it's a big bunch of space junk. Okay, it's called the Oort cloud. Uh, you can look it up for yourself. So you know, just another one, little point. Uh, okay. The the point is, it goes way out, so it's not easily seen. The other point is, there's an argument as to whether it is on what they call the plane of the ecliptic. That is basically the flat plane, so to speak, the flat plane that all of our planets circle around the sun. If you sitting in a chair, you put your right arm out to the side, your left arm straight out, that would represent the plane of the ecliptic where most of our planets circle with us around the sun. If you go down about 12 inches with your hand, that would be approximately a 30 degrees off of the ecliptic. Many of the astronomers are saying the possibility exists that planet X is on a plane of its own orbiting on approximately 30 degrees off of our ecliptic. So it would be, theoretically, um, for simplistic terms, it would be coming in like from below and coming up on an angle, passing up around the sun and then going back down on an angle to be out again, and not on the same plane that we are all on. Okay, just a little scientific question well, that's out there. Well, so instead of it going from, say, right to left, it would actually be going from up to down, like through the disk? <laughs> Well, yeah, see, so you really get into complexities because <laughs> it's, it's, see, it's hard, it's hard to get a grasp on all of this anyhow because it's, see, when you, you know, when we draw it on a piece of paper, it's just flat. 
right? We got a flat piece of paper. You got a television screen. It's flat in front of you. And you say, okay, over here is a big yellow thing, and that's the sun. And here are seven or eight, nine planets, and they're all going around the sun. And that all looks real simple. The reality is, um, from every possible, if you going from the sun, from every possible degree imaginable on a 360 circle, things can be traveling on it, that circle. So it, it becomes, you know, some kind of an extraordinary thing. You can't just say, you, you know, it's not like you just say to, um, say to your, somebody, your neighbor, say, look, you know, just go out there, look at the moon, go over to the left about a foot, and there it is <laughs> over there, okay? Well, if it's coming from, first off, from behind the sun, there's a period of time um, that, that we would never see it. It's a very interesting point I'm going to make, and then I don't want to lose the rest of the time here. Uh, where are we at? Where do you have? How much time? Oh, uh, we we've got about ten minutes to go, and I do have a couple questions from the chat as okay, well. Okay, good. I want to I want to expedite this then. Um, the um, remember the Russians had that meteorite that came in and exploded and blew windows out. Oh yeah. Right. Everybody saw that. Watch. It was amazing. Nobody in the globe ever saw that coming. Never did they see that coming until it was passing through our into our atmosphere and blew up even nasa didn't know no no one knew the russians didn't know the americans didn't know nasa didn't know it came in like a surprise package from quote unquote behind our visual point of the sun they were waiting for another one as a matter of fact that they knew about and they knew all about it five years ago that it was going to come in and pass and go around and then this thing uh, came in, boom, as a surprise. So when people say, oh, well, you can't see it, uh, like one very prominent radio guy that in interviewed me, it's an old friend of mine that actually said that I was the reason he got into talk radio, one of the most popular guys on talk radio, all right? Uh, he he doesn't believe this. And he says, if I can't see it, I don't believe it's there. Okay, well, uh, you can measure measure the IQ from that one. Uh, anyhow, uh, <laughs> all right, so, but moving back to it. It's going to be seen in December for the first time. Now, Mr. Broussard, Broussard says this December. It will be seen in December. It will take January, February, March as it gets bigger on a daily basis coming inward. And then in March, March, the, and I'm, using, I'm quoting Gill, the 26th will be its closest point of pass going around the, in the sun uh, and then it will go around and go back on out he is feeling his and again this is because measuring all the previous times in history when it was said to be seen and it was written in and logged in and where the sun was and where the earth was where the stars were etc cetera, etc cetera, he feels the most likely time is this December for the first sighting of Nibiru by telescope and then by visually, by by your own eye, if we look. Okay. If it does not happen this December, he says it would most likely then not to be a concern until the next December. It appears that in all of the writings of all the times, including the Bible, of when the stars were blocked and the, and the, the showers of meteors and the water flooded like Mo uh, the floods of Noah and all of those things, and all the rest, not just biblical, but other scriptural identifications, it appears that it was always December, January, February, March, and April, and then back out again and be gone for at least 350, 360 years. Now, it, it could vary in the amount of destruction. The problem is Number one, the flooding because of gravitational effects. It could be like Noah's floods yanking the water right out of the seabeds. It could, according to old writings, it could, in fact, tilt the Earth 26 degrees on its axis. When we pass, now again, you can visualize this, if you will, visualize the sun as a basketball or whatever, and take a golf ball, being the, the, uh, the it's not quite that big, but um, the basketball and the golf ball, the golf ball being the birus coming in. When it comes in, uh, we will, it will take us one, one hour to pass through the tail. And that's by taking the measurement of the diameter uh, that, that they expect it to be and taking the earth to go through it. On a, and actually, it, what happens is it goes, it approaches the sun it will go around behind it. It will already be gone around behind it. And we will 
then come around and catch up to the tail, and we will go through the tail. We'll take an hour traveling our normal speed going around the sun. We will pass through it, remembering that the Earth is also revolving. So it will expose whatever uh, a certain amount of geography to the frontal ex uh, exposure of all of the space junk that's coming behind it, like the tail of Halley's Comet, which, by the way, is 24 million miles long. We have no idea how long this one is, but we will only go through it once. Then it will travel around and it will take 155 days at its passing around, and we would go through it a second time when it has gone on out, gone, you know, the, the Nibiru had gone on out into space again to be gone for and leave us alone for a while. We will pass through it one more time. So we have two periods of time separated by approximately five months, which, by the way, happens to be biblical, the biblical description of it, of Wormwood coming around and five months of tribulation beyond our imagination and then calm after it departs. That's all biblical stuff. The, um, uh, so, and again, Gill's feeling that if it doesn't, if it's not available, not seen December, January this year and coming on in, then we're probably okay for another full year because it is on the time of Passover between March and April when the, uh, the problems uh, existed from it previously. Now, okay. if I can answer any questions, I will do so. Absolutely. Uh, one question was, are you aware of uh, photographs of Planet X? I guess people want to know where they can go see it, uh, where they can, you know, where they should look. Like uh, NASA had that block on it for a long time, or, or Google Earth did, or, or oh, Google, Google Earth. Sky. You're talking about the location to see it? Yeah, like if... Uh, no, no. And and uh, there there are a few people that are you know, saying, oh, it's, it's, it's here and it's there. And it's there. Um, I, the, the reality is, Here's what I think is going to be the best signal for us, okay? And again, I said this earl earlier. In the United States, and I believe they will do it on, in the other parts of the world, there has to be martial law in place before December, okay? The feeling, again, being that uh, by, the, by the time it becomes visual and seen, in, in reality, you know, where you can actually say, oh, there it is, and it's getting bigger every night, and it's coming inward, and it takes December, January, February, March. It's like four months for it to be in a real problem area. The first thing to go out are going to be satellites and that type of thing, electronically. Uh, that, that'll be the first, first problem. Then we're going to have meteor storms, and we're going to have stuff falling into the oceans that's going to cause tsunamis. And by the way, I have to point this out, too. Just a couple of weeks ago, the, the fellow who is um, uh, considered to be... Um, I, I always get his name wrong. Yeah, I think his name is Katu, Dr. Katu or Katu. Oh, yeah. He's Kako or whatever his name. I, I apologize to him. He was on ABC at CBS and CNN, all of them, just less than a month ago, a couple weeks ago. And he said that they are anticipating off of the coast of Oregon. Remember I told you there's already a volcano. They're keeping that quiet. They're saying that there's a, a big, strange, unusual blob in the water that's heating up the water. Believe it or not, that's what they're saying on television, a blob. It's not very official. <laughs> but they don't want us to understand what's going on. They don't want you to put two and two together. Okay, Kaito was on both, all the major networks. He said they are anticipating a movement of the plates seismographically uh, off of... Uh, the uh, uh, off the coast there, the west coast near Oregon, that's where that volcano is already bubbling. Uh, they call it the Cascadia Zone, and they expect it to generate, have an earthquake there under the water, and generate a tsunami that will totally destroy the entire west coast of, uh, of the United States, from northern California to Alaska, hmm. completely wiping out s Seattle. Well, and they are anticipating it, and it was on television with him explaining it and talking to the people about it. And, of course, that was a quickly uh, vanished, that son of a gun. But um, that's in that same place where I said the volcano is already bubbling and already heating the water and changing our weather. Now, can I answer another question? Yes, please. Uh, the next question is, I have a couple more here we'll get to. The next one is Jade Helm. Um, what's your, Jade what's your Helm, thoughts on it? Sure. Jade Helm is a practice for martial law. I knew nothing about it when I did this. 
uh, when I put this thing out, uh, you know, finished it up in the first, the first of this year, uh, I knew nothing about it. I have to tell you, n not only is that a practice dry run, but they did one in 1984. It was called Rex 84, but it's more serious now because of what I'm talking about. And I will also tell you that uh, what upset some people, and they didn't talk much about it, Red China had a duplicate exercise about three weeks ago. Practicing controlling the public in the time of a, an excessive, uncontrollable public. And that's what it is. All right. Great. And uh, last but not least, does your guest recommend a underground bunker? And if so, how, how far down? Okay. Here's the point. You cannot, and you do not have the time, and you cannot, uh, you couldn't do one if you started now, but there are underground bunkers. I don't sell them, um, but there are underground facilities that will cost from 300 to a million dollars, and you can get an entire floor. They're completely finished. They're done. They are in uh, atomic silos, the old uh, uh, atomic weapon silos, fully converted, very luxurious, with that food and all the rest of that. You can look these up yourself. Look up um, public, uh, public silo underground facilities. If you do that in a computer, you'll find three or four, and you can go and buy one. If you've got a million bucks, you can get one. All right. Well, sounds good, Bob. Uh, we're out of time. I, I thank you for joining us, and and uh, people can go to your website, obviously, and, and learn a lot more, right? Yeah, go on the website. Matter of fact, I have colored pictures of the underground facilities. I have a list of every location of the known underground facilities. Uh, well, I'd maybe say most of the known ones. And... Um, by the way, it's uh, and, and and again, you folks can write me at uh, post office box two one six at Bayview, Idaho two one six, the zip eight three eight zero three for the people that are not computer savvy. Those of you who are computer savvy, go on my website, Bob Fletcher Investigations, and uh, all the information's there. I I highly recommend get the DVD package four hours. We pay for shipping at twenty four ninety five, uh, and it's. Uh, it's an entire library. It has all of the answers to your questions. And God bless everybody. I hope that I am really wrong on this one. Uh, the bad part is everything I've done in the past uh, turned out to be correct. Well, I, I hope you're wrong too, Bob. But uh, I guess time will tell, won't it? So uh, it sure will. But uh, you know, it's whatever. God bless everybody. Uh, and uh, just to live day to day and do the best you can. Uh, you know, don't go crazy over it. Uh, because if it's as big as it is. Nothing's going to stop it. All right. Well, Bob, uh, again, thank you so much, and uh, we'll have to talk again very soon. I, I appreciate you coming. There's going to be on. some uh, backup information I'm going to want to give you guys. All right. Great. Well, just uh, please email me, and, and if need be, uh, we'll have to pull you back on for any updates. So thank you. Okay. Very good. <clears throat> Take care. All right. Have a good one. Uh, Bob Fletcher, folks, uh, this has been a broadcast of Late Night in the Midlands. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, I'll call it the Bob Show tonight, which I'm not complaining. Uh, he had a ton. I mean, he's, he's given you his information. I really, you know, I don't have a ton of questions uh, when it comes to Bob. Bob's more the guy you uh, kind of like a, a Linda Moten Howell. You just want to give the mic and say, all right, go ahead. And so that's what we do with Bob. Um the last couple times he's been here. So uh hope you've enjoyed. Tomorrow night, uh, there'll be a whole lot of interaction because tomorrow night we'll be answering your questions with Marie, the E.T. Marie. little bit about bob fletcher uh but please again make sure you get over to the website check it out we put uh news stories which will appear on the home page uh down near the bottom every single day sometimes we miss out on the weekends because you know even we need days off but uh, uh so anyways who is bob fletcher well he's a businessman he's an investigator a film producer a radio personality author Federal witness, whistleblower, patriot, he's hes all that. And a bag of books, folks, because uh, he's going to, the, the information that he's going to share with us tonight, um, well, you can write a lot of books, there's that much. I don't even know if we'll get to everything tonight, but one thing we are going to get to is, 
Well, this planet, call it Planet X, call it Nibiru, call it what you will, but uh, there are some pretty prominent people out there who claim it is there and that it is coming our way. So we'll see uh, where we go tonight here. We'll take your calls as well. Um, Bob Fletcher, I'm going to bring him on the air with us here in just a second. Um, doing all this on my own, folks, so i got to kind of talk you through it as I go. Otherwise, it's going to be dead air. All right, so here we go. Bob Fletcher. He's been here before, by the way. All right, we're just waiting on an answer, and we'll uh, we'll get this. Okay, I see what happened. All right, I got right. you now, Bob. That, that's yeah. I was a little confused. I couldn't hear you, but now I can. Uh-oh. Now, aboard. All right. well, welcome aboard. I, I appreciate you coming back on late night in the Midlands, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you tonight. Ah, thank you very much. And um, we've got a lot of new things I want to talk about, but basically, it's all the same. Uh, our same consideration, our our serious problem out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wherever you would like to start would be just great. Um, I'll tell you, I would like to say this. I've seen this uh, on your website, the crop circle picture, which I've seen that crop circle before. But what I haven't seen before is how you laid it out. There's another picture below, and it pretty much shows the constellation and, and what you're looking at in that crop circle. And yes. I, I think you know what I'm talking about, right? And I, yeah, yeah, I do. Of course, that's one of 800 million bits of pieces, but, <laughs> but, but yes, I do, yes. Yeah, the bottom line is, and, and actually there are several others that, that I, don't, I don't feel schooled enough to really get into that too much, but nonetheless, there are several that are all kind of did in, indications of, uh, of the Nibiru coming back in. Okay, well, you know, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just say this, that that crop circle, I mean, you know, people always say, well, you know, where's the warnings? Well, that kind of looks like one to me. So, but like you said, it's one of the many. So wherever you'd like to start with this topic is okay with me. Uh, um, go for it. Oh, okay, and, uh, and unfortunately, <clears throat> because I've, uh, I've, been, I've been doing this, not necessarily with this particular subject, but my investigative stuff, I've been doing it for so long that I found out that it's best uh, um, for me to give a little bit of background. I hate to do that because it takes time, but I won't take too much time. But people have to, so that they understand, uh, you know, you, in my case, I've been trying to, you know, chasing bad guys, basically, in government for so long. You know, but there are people that don't know uh, anything about it, and then there are people that know a little bit, and then there are people that know a lot, and then, there, you know, that kind of thing. So we kind of try to uh, bring everybody up to speed in the first few minutes, um, you know, on the entire situation, <laughs> bring, bring them up to speed on a hundred years of corruption, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> All right, let's do that then. All right, so a hundred years of corruption coming up. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, we are live, and and I'll try to. You give me a heads up on your when you're going to do your breaks, and I, I'm completely cool with this. You know, it's about my my four thousandth uh, radio interview, so I'm almost understanding it now. All right, great. Well, well, we're live now, so we can uh, we can okay. go we can go right ahead. Uh, we don't have okay. another a break coming up for almost an hour now. So okay, very good. But it's a, it's really a pleasure to be back again, uh, and because um, we. Uh, we, we've spoken, and what, what has uh, really occupied my time now for, um, well, it's been about over three years, but it even went back farther than that. But so, as I was saying, so that everybody kind of understand, uh, this is even something that I would not have even put my name to this without having an awful lot, right, without being totally convinced that, in fact, this is a real situation. Uh, I'm, I'm not a... Um, uh, and I don't mean to demean anybody that's a, a, a reporter or anything of that sort, but I'm not, I'm not like a newspaper reporter or a guy that's been doing uh, you know, journalism for a long time or anything of that sort. Uh, I ended up becoming, actually 30 years ago, I was um, uh, accidentally, if you will, dragged into uh, the corruption of government, and I was overwhelmed when it happened, like so many other people, when they really find out how generally corrupted the government is, right straight across the board. And um, uh, it, it's a, a very interesting story, as I mentioned, going, going way back. I can't, we can't spend the time logically on giving uh, those people that like, don't know me at all, but I'm going to try to give you a very brief situation. Uh, what happened was I had a business. I was in, in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had a business in the 80s, uh, and I... Uh, was expanding that company. It literally was very simply a toy manufacturing company. Uh, so 
uh, it, it was totally not related to politics, not related to journalism or, or exposing government to corruption or any of those things. I was just trying to make my first million dollars the American dream, as they say. Yeah. And what happened was I merged my company with a, a company and a particular fellow that headed it up. His name was Gary Best, uh, and uh, uh, he had a uh, um, he was owner of, uh, the president owner of uh, a holding company, I guess is the best way to call it. And he had several companies uh, under his belt that he owned under these variety of corporate names. But the bottom line was, uh, our deal, my deal with him was to uh, merge uh, with part of his, one of his companies that delivered products to the 7-Eleven convenience store types of uh, locations, a variety of things. And several of my toys he wanted to put into the, the, those stores. And it was a real good deal for me on the outside. Unfortunately, I never got paid, so it, it turned out obviously not to be a good deal. But what happened was this gentleman, uh, using that term very loosely, this criminal son of a gun was, in fact, uh, an arms supplier, an arms dealer supplying weapons to all of the small wars generated by the United States covert operations. He was in, uh, representing the uh, CIA, the National Security Agency, the Defense Intelligence Operations, uh, the Air Force Intelligence, and a whole variety of the secret covert operators that actually ran all the wars around the globe. And uh, lo and behold, they wanted to uh, recruit myself. They wanted to utilize my toy company as a covert front, giving m the reason for his people to travel into a variety of different countries, do different things. And actually, in my case, he wanted me to be a, a covert messenger delivering uh, information and bringing information back from a variety of locations around the globe. At that time, they were doing the Iran-Contra stuff. That's uh, the uh, Nicaraguan rebels and the revolutionary group there. And the, the operations were also later to be discovered not only unconstitutional and wrong, uh, and they had, of course, the big investigations, for those of you old enough to remember it, the big investigations uh, called the Iran-Contra inquiries at the, the congressional level. I became a federal witness in those investigations. Then following that, because all of the people that were involved with this guy and doing all of the what they call supplying weapons, the, the, the suppliers of the weapons, um, they were military generals that had all run the, the Vietnam War so many years earlier. Uh, and, of course, they had carried on their arms delivery operations for covert operations uh, in the, in, up to the future, and they were still doing it, and they were doing the same thing. Many of these operations became, uh, to my, my shock, uh, they were directly involved with narcotics, where they would actually deliver weapons, exchange half of the payment would be in narcotics, and actually fly the narcotics back to the United States, delivering it into the streets with mafia cooperation, as a matter of fact, but fly it literally back to our Air Force bases, our own air bases, unload the drugs off of the aircraft that were U.S. government-supplied airplanes that had delivered the drugs, I mean, delivered the weapons down to some place, wherever it was, and brought the drugs back. So it was, to my amazement, what we literally had, quite obviously, and then I was to find out that it had been going on for years and years, 20, 30, 40, I don't know how many more years ahead of me, but it had been going on for years with our intelligence community doing the jobs that we hope they're doing, covert good operations, but they were um, a handful or half of it at least, if not more, were criminal activities involving the exchange of narcotics, and this was going right out with the nod and the approval of the President of the United States. So. Uh, that's how, I, uh, and I was blown away. I witnessed it. I saw it. They were selling multi-million dollar aircraft out of my toy factory. They were moving missiles, Hellfire missiles, through my, my toy factory, uh, making the sales and all of that uh, uh, for, for operations all over the globe. And uh, so that's what got me into it. And I preface all of that so that you get a general handle, an idea, uh, and an understanding that uh, again, I'm not just some writer that um, met a few people and interviews a few people. <laughs> the, fo 
Go ahead. Excuse me. Oh no, I, I just. I, oh no, I was just laughing there for a moment because. Oh, okay. <laughs> if you have a question, as a matter of fact, feel free. Because, but otherwise, it's best if I kind of just roll along with this and and fill um, fill in the holes. Usually, uh, b- before your your uh, uh, the question might come to mind, I'll probably answer it. Oh, you bet. The, the, so the problem was, well, I, I, call, I don't know, I guess it's, it was really a problem. Uh, I ended up being brought back, not just a, after the Iran-Contra mess with all of these characters. I ended up having people from the Pentagon, from the CIA, the FBI, the ATF, and every other variety of, uh, uh, let's say, law, hopefully, law enforcement agents, contacted me and congressmen and senators and the intelligence committees and what have you at, at the extreme highest levels uh, coming right out of the Capitol building and uh, all the congressional buildings. What would happen over the next few years that turned into 30 years? Um, but what happened is uh, people would call me, a, a senator would write me a letter or, or I would be called or contacted one way or another or what have you. And a lot of this was, by the way, before we even had uh, the Internet. So uh, they were... Uh, uh, you know, being sent to me by fax machines and things of that sort. But the questions were, coming from those folks, was uh, over and over again, somebody would say, Bob, what do you know about this name? What do you know about this operation? Have you ever heard the name of this operation? Or do you have any idea, have anybody, uh, this, this guy and that guy and that guy that was involved with uh, your, your toy company, um, had you ever heard that connected to this other name over here? So... I ended up supplying uh, investigative research information uh, that much of it became top secret or classified secret uh, after I delivered it to them. In other words, uh, you know, it was a, that's something I had given them that was so hot, so important at such a high level that they would classify it after I delivered it to them. And, and basically, I was originally a toy, a toy manu- manufacturer. Now, uh, not to shortchange myself, I had, and part of the reason of how I had been targeted to be merged with this uh, operation. By the way, it was called a VISTA, V-I-S-T-A was the name of the corporate entity uh, that had all of these operations going on. Um, and, uh, and later on, I found out they were involved with so many things, including the uh, blowing up of the Oklahoma building uh, in, uh, in Oklahoma back there, the federal building back in uh, uh, 95 or whenever it was. The... Um, uh, but they had their hands in many dirty deals way, way beyond um, uh, what I ever would have expected. So I, anyhow, I became uh, a, a guy that was an investigative researcher with people, became friends of mine, congressmen, senators, central intelligence operatives, uh, one friend that became real close, uh, and uh, she, she was an, a, a woman a little bit older than myself that had been in the CIA and, and connected all the way back to Ronald Reagan's time. And uh, she literally wrote speeches and did analysis from the Central Intelligence Direction for um, uh, the, the Reagan administration uh, and, and, and many other people at that level. So when I, um, uh, as I moved forward, uh, as I say, I got dragged into just a huge multitude of, uh, uh, of uh, extraordinary investigations and inquiries. So a few years ago, and I won't go over all of them, but it even involved being actually contracted by Manuel Noriega's lawyers and uh, doing a request. I was in- interviewed by the Intelligence Senate Intelligence Committee. I was uh, formally requested to put together a-, a report on the Oklahoma bombs by the Senate Intelligence Committee, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's where it all started from. Uh, and so a few years ago, I was used to chasing money chasing uh, uh, senators and congressmen, et cetera, that uh, had, in one way or another, were, were stealing, i put it in, in blunt terms, and, you know, and, and uh, diverting or fraudulently getting a couple million bucks for, for a new house they wanted to build in uh, Tahiti for themselves or a new place, uh, uh, something they wanted to do over here or a business they wanted to get into. But we're talking about the theft of millions of dollars, usually, and um, a million is a lot for an average guy like myself and like most all of our, uh, our listeners. Um, but, th- but it became commonplace so that if somebody called me and said, hey, have you ever heard of the so-and-so operation? It looks like they're involved with stealing about $10 million every, uh, every couple of months for something. Uh, and uh, those things became commonplace. But three, four years ago, I guess at this time, it's almost four, uh, 
I started looking into the disappearance of, uh, of several billion dollars. And uh, I, I couldn't figure out where it was going originally, uh, but then it even moved up from several billion dollars to several trillion dollars over a long period of time, all coming, going in the same direction. Uh, but the big problem is, uh, as we, you, you can commonly realize, when you start talking about a few billion or it moves into trillions, and it, you have a problem to figure out where could money like that go? Because, you know, you, you have to realize that, like even in these giant drug and arms operations, now we talk about arms, you know, arms contracts that go out for the, the creation and study of new weapons and the manufacturing of weapons and aircraft and rockets and, and explosives and all of those uh, high-level uh, type of um, weaponry, uh, that's, it, it's easy. They can take a few million out of one little location and transfer it over here, or a couple million here and a couple million there, and pretty soon they've got a, a pretty good little bunch of money mm -hmm. to use in any manner they want. But if you get beyond billions and start talking trillions, and uh, then you really have you really have something strange going on, even for the commonplace thieves out of Washington D.C. And, and by the way, there's nothing partisan on this at all. My discovery was that the Senate, the Congress, and those and assigned um, uh, people that are, uh, let's say, at the ambassadorial level the assigned people, the people that are not even elected and are appointed into these high positions uh, of the administrations with each uh, presidency, uh, those people... Uh